Welcome to today's webcast series presentation, Your Employees, the most important asset you're neglecting. My name is Beth Brooks. I'm the Director of Civil and Structural Engineer Media. Thank you for joining this webcast, which is sponsored by BQE Software. Before we begin today's presentation, first, some general information about the webcast and the GoToWebcast platform. The views of the speakers and organizations participating in this webcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of Civil and Structural Engineer or its publisher, Zwei Group. If you have any technical difficulties while viewing this webcast, please submit questions or a brief explanation of your technical problem using the question tab on GoToWebinar control panel and a representative will assist you. During the webcast, you can also submit questions to our speaker using the same question tab. Submit your questions at any time and we will try to answer as many as we can later in the webcast. So why group encourages group learning for our events. If you are viewing the live webcast with a group on one registered person's computer, that person must complete and submit the multiple viewer registration form for the group in order for everyone to earn credit. Download the multiple viewer registration form from the handouts tab on the control panel. Submission instructions are on the form. Viewers of archive webcasts must pass a quiz in order to download a certificate of completion. Today's presenter is Stephen Burns. Stephen is a licensed architect and a member of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects. He sold his architectural firm in 2007 to work full-time on a startup he launched to create Archie Office and Engineer Office, and then brought his expertise to BQE Software. He earned his Master of Architecture from the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Syracuse University. His passions include ultra-endurance cycling. He's ridden as far as 522 miles without stopping and working with LA Social Venture Partners to help innovative nonprofits change the landscape for social justice. And now I'm going to hand it over to Stephen. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Beth, for that introduction. Let me um, take over the controls here. So I'll make presenter and I'll show my screen. <clears throat> so I think we're going to have to change that to introduction later on. It seems a little awkward. Anyway, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining me today. Um, <clears throat> in case you didn't know, we did a survey and 33% of engineers state that they are bored at work and that they need new challenges. And this is what motivates them to look for a new job. Another survey showed that 66% of engineers plan not to stay at their current company for the long term. So you may not realize this, but we actually have a human resources crisis that's brewing. Every one of your employees for which you don't have a silver handcuff, they can pack up and they can move immediately to another firm where they'll have more opportunities and probably better pay. So what are you going to do about that? And one of the most common things we hear from engineering firms is their claim that people are their most important asset. And while I think that it's a noble statement to say that, maybe in your marketing materials, it's actually a far cry from your ability to actually deliver on that statement. So I wanna thank you for attending this webinar because as someone who has spent the bulk of my 33 years, you know, career working in the AE industry, a webinar on HR is about the last thing I would have ever thought that I would want to attend. But my guess is most of you here today can clearly see that trouble lies ahead and that this is a worthy topic to look into. Now, before I dive in, I'm going to be conducting, I think, three or four poll questions throughout my webinar, and I'd appreciate it if you can give me a swift response, and I'll even share the results with you. So my first question is, does your firm have a formalized system for managing your human resources? So yes, uh, you have a software system that you use, or yes, you do it manually, or no, there's really no formalized system. And that's the key word here, formalized. 
So if you can let me know that, I'll give you a, uh, like 10 more seconds. If you can just let me know, it's a simple poll. Shouldn't take too long. Also a good way to make sure you're paying attention and alert because I can see how many how many of you are actually responding. Five seconds. Okay, I'm going to close down the poll and let's go ahead and share the results. So it looks like uh, about 40% of you say no, you have actually no system and it's kind of close either way that you know the other 30% um, do have a system. So good to know, but the important thing here is that most of you don't. So let's get a, go ahead and move on with this. So I believe most people attending today's webinar are engineers or are they working in an engineering firm? And the content that I'm gonna cover, it's not just exclusive to you, but I also wanna explain that I'm acutely aware that ours is a small business. And here are some facts. About 80% of engineering firms have fewer than 10 employees, and yet only 30% of all the employees work in those firms. So most of the employees are actually working at the few firms at the, at the top, the 20%. So only the top 3% of firms have more than 50 employees, but they hire 37% of all the employees in the engineering industry. And if you think about some of those earlier stats I was talking about at the start of the session, you're going to begin to realize even the smallest firms are going to have to figure out a way to formalize a human resources policy, um, not only to maintain your current staff, but also to attract new talent. And your firm needs to stand out uniquely, not only to your clients, but just as important to prospective employees. You want to make your firm attractive to them so that they'll come and work for you. So. HR is typically a word that doesn't, you know, sit well with most people. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the ugly necessity that some firms think about. Uh, so there's a perception of HR. If you've ever had the opportunity, as I did, at working for a very large firm, you know, one of the 3%, you would know that if someone ever said the phrase, let's ask human resources or let's talk to HR, it's like, being back in high school and you were told, let's go to the principal's office. You know, your spine's gonna stiffen, you know nothing good is gonna come of this, it's the last place you really wanna be, and you know, you've got better things to do with your time. So that HR is actually a trigger word. It's like, it's a trigger for either some sort of disciplinary action, like, you know, you're pulled over by the police, or it might be you're experiencing personal problems which are impacting your work and you need to go to HR for some counseling, it's sometimes looked at as uh, the bureaucratic part of the firm, which is just about making sure the paperwork is all in order and you're satisfying some you know, regulatory agencies. Or it's that group that's trying to make work feel fun and putting on a happy hours and you know, quasi entertaining activities. And very frankly, none of that is really very good as far as the perception goes. So let's be very careful about how your company builds its HR portion of the firm. So that you can evolve from the police to more of maybe the caring coach. Now, a lot of firms consider HR to be an administrative burden. It's also why so many firms just push their HR responsibilities to companies like ADP or other professional employment organizations, PEOs, that, so they, they can administer it. And if you do this, then I'd also ask you to consider what those outsourced companies are missing. Sure, they have the, the tools to meet the minimal requirements, but they don't really understand your firm, your culture, your business. Uh, what does it mean to be an engineer or to have any of the other allied professionals that you have on your team? What does it mean to be working maybe in a creative environment, in an office or a studio like yours with a culture that might be unique to your firm? Those organizations can't possibly help you with delivering on that promise that your employees are your most important asset. So that task is gonna be up to you. So you must be very clear as to what these companies provide and then do the more important work of understanding how HR can actually enhance your firm's performance and not just deal with the legal and the accounting and the insurance, uh, your payroll functions of being an employer. So 
I suggest you look at human resources as a strategic partner that's capable of truly enhancing your firm's performance. Now let's say you're already doing a great job on the individual level. Perhaps you've already have a, developed a process within your firm that helps recruit the best employees and you're able to match them with the benefits and the incentives that motivate them. Let's assume that you have created programs within the firm to help solve skill deficiencies through training. Maybe your firm adopted new CAD or BIM software or some other software tools and you've invested in training so your staff can get up to speed quickly, they can become pro pro productive and efficient. And yes, those will yield positive results for the individual's performance, but does that automatically enhance your organizational performance? And the short answer is gonna be no. There's no direct correlation when improving an individual's performance that likewise improves the company's overall performance. And there's an entire system of related components that connects all the employees to the organization and those parts. And these conduits, they're all gonna need attention. So, for countless decades, traditional HR departments were focused on individuals. And today, we've realized our failures and a successful human resource department has multiple levels for analysis, from the individual to the team, right up to the organization. And many firms have underestimated the significance that every individual has towards the entirety of the organization. And sadly, most small engineering firms don't even take the time and effort to think strategically. But for those firms that really like to work on their business and you know, not only in the business, they have adopted a careful understanding of the market and the business opportunities, um, never really connecting the goal with the players in the field. So you know, your team are your, your you know, the, the team on the field is your are your employees. And so you gotta kinda like look at all of these moving parts and figure out how they fit into the big strategy. I have a thesis here that your firm needs to align your human resources strategy with your company's strategy. So if you're gonna build that football team, you would know that every single player on the field has a defined skill and a purpose without which you couldn't win. And this is why you really need to stop and look at the people in your firm and evaluate what type of value do they create for the firm and how does their value align with the firm's overarching missions? You know, do you have too many, you know, field goal kickers, right? You know, so think about each member of that team and their contribution to the whole uh, and, you know, winning that game. And finally, have you established a system for measuring the, what I like to call the value creation process? This is, isn't really just a, a subjective exercise where you look around and say, hey, you know, Tom's a great guy, a uh, talented engineer, can really put together a great set of, you know, CDs. This is short-sighted thinking, and it doesn't acknowledge the many interrelated parts that separate Tom as an individual from the, the totality of the firm or even the clients you serve and their final products that you deliver to them. HR as a system is just as complex as most buildings that you work on. So nearly all of us really do acknowledge that our employees are our most important asset. Then the next logical statement would be as assets, they have, uh, they've really come on board through our investment. And with each passing month, we continue to invest in those assets. So fire an employee and you've just thrown away an investment. Hire the wrong employee and you're making a bad investment. And this is a very different way of thinking than most firms are willing to accept. They look at their employees as an expense. And I'm gonna discuss more about that in a few minutes. All of you are using accounting software to manage your finances, but make no mistake, a conventional accounting system and, and basically accounting in general was created at a time when tangible capital both physical and financial was just the primary source of your profits but we are all in a service business you're not selling tangible goods the thing that your clients are paying you for the that asset that your firm has is each and every one of your employees every member of the team 
this group of people is the primary source of your profits. And I will admit, some of you've also figured out how to turn your, you know, your large format printer into an amazing profit center, but that's not why you're in business. So you have to change how you think about your people. Now, I recall the time when my business partner and I were contemplating purchasing, purchasing our first large format printer. It was a huge expense at the time. It was in the mid 90s. And we really suffered long and hard about whether we should you know, bite the bullet and buy one. It was going to cost a serious amount of money. And it took us only a couple of months for us to get that return on that investment. We never really suffered so much uh, when it came to hiring and onboarding our staff, but it was with that printer. So conventional accounting generates short-term thinking when it comes to your employees. It does this because they're treated as an expense while those tangible expenditures are treated as assets or investments. And by the way, those are depreciated over their useful lives. Remember, it's very expensive to hire and onboard your employees. It's far more expensive than to maintain your staff and just keep them well-trained. So firm managers really ought to appreciate this way of thinking since they're salaries are often tied to their earnings. And clearly they would prefer to see expenditures that can be depreciated over time rather than conventional people-related expenditures that are expensed in their entirety during the current year. And now while the IRS isn't gonna look kindly to your booking your employee's salary into an investment column, it doesn't stop you from changing your thinking about what you're spending on those resources. It's very common for firms to have a goodwill asset listed on their balance sheet. Goodwill is for those intangible assets that are frequently divided into three categories. It's personal goodwill, intellectual goodwill, and business goodwill. And don't forget, by the way, that that current unemployment rate today is about 3.7%, and that means anyone in your firm, you know, uh, you know, anybody, anybody your firm would at least want to hire is already gainfully employed. They're not looking for a job. So what are you going to do to keep your current employees and make them better at their jobs and uh, not make them want to go somewhere else? And what are you also going to do in the firm to make it more attractive for other people to come work for you? Now, after I graduated from grad school, I spent my first seven years working at one of the largest firms in the world, and it was always made clear to me that there was no such thing as an indispensable employee. Clients were taught that they were hiring the partner, or, you know, um, I'm sorry, that they're, they're not hiring the partner or a studio head, they're hiring a firm. And that firm had incredibly deep and talented bench of, you know, performers. It's not a house of cards that would crumble if anybody left the firm. So when you look at your own staff, you should recognize that there's a gap between your book value and your market value, and it's pretty significant. If you had to let go of half of your staff, your book value would probably remain unchanged. But my guess is that the market value of your firm would be significantly diminished. Most engineering firms are small, and many rely on the principal to take up that gap between the market value and the book value. So the inevitable prop problem with the setup is what happens when the principal wants to retire or there's some unfortunate life event that you know concludes their involvement with the firm it's a common and unfortunate problem with firm owners who are late to the party when it comes to considering a succession plan they put too much goodwill value into themselves and not enough into the team that they've really surrounded themselves with so clearly your employees are your competitive advantage they are the secret of your flexibility, your innovation, and your speed to market. And there's a lot that goes into that seemingly simple sentence, but developing and cultivating talent means when you go after a project, you can clearly demonstrate your advantage in those three areas. So just imagine if you saw a business opportunity for which your team was unqualified or unavailable, that would be an enormous barrier to entry. And this simply proves the point again that HR is the source of that competitive advantage. So I'm going to ask each of you to assign someone in your firm to be an HR manager. This is a role that is just as important, dare I say, or even more important than a project manager. And 
the charge you should give them is that they need to make the dramatic shift from the norm and start managing by the numerator rather than the denominator. And what I mean by this is they should see employees as contributing to revenue and growth, which is your numerator, rather than looking at them as an expense, which you can easily cut to reduce your overhead, which is the denominator. And you see many firms just slash employees when a project ends and uh, they just don't have uh, the, the, the cash flow to really manage their salaries. So your firm also needs to rethink its incentives. You must link and align the individual performance with the project performance and the company performance so it meets the expectations of the firm's stakeholders. So if your employees are your greatest assets, then they must be treated as an asset and not an expense. That's a long-winded way of getting that uh, point hopefully off to you. Poll number two right now is, does your firm have a formalized system for recruiting new employees? So let me launch the poll, whoops, uh, right there, and we'll launch the poll. And the answer is, yes, we do have a formalized system for recruiting, uh, but we do it manually, or yes, you have a software program or a software solution out there that you use, or no, you simply hire people, you know, put an ad out or whatever it is, when the need arises. There's not a lot of transition or um, turnover in your firm. So give me a quick response to that. And hopefully my next section won't be as confusing as the uh, first section about the asset or the numerator. We'll give you five more seconds, guys. Please let me know. Do you have a formalized system for recruiting new employees? Three, two, one. And uh, we'll show the results, results. but 47% of you say no. And uh, the majority of those who do have a system, they just kind of do it manually. So great, that helps me understand a bit more about you. And let's move on to the next slide. Okay, like this guy, like this slide. So your firm's gonna need to create two strategies, one that's for your company and one that's for your employees. And let's see how those things gonna interrelate. So a corporate strategy, you probably know, it's one where you create that sustained competitive advantage. It's what differentiates you from all those other firms and it makes your clients hire you. But your HR strategy is one that maximizes the human capital that delivers on that competitive advantage. So it is HR's function to ensure that professionals within the firm have the skills that are required to achieve your goals. It then follows that a system needs to be implemented within the firm that ensures that there are high performance and strategically aligned policies around your human resources that are now in place. So there's gotta be an HR infrastructure. You can't expect individuals, no matter how talented, to achieve your goals when they act alone or they're unaccountable. And lastly, you need to work on developing a team that has uh, strategically focused competencies, motivations, and all the associated uh, behaviors that align with your corporate strategy. And I'm fairly brutal in my thinking, but any employee for whom you can't draw a line between them and your corporate strategy, that's a bad investment. And it sh should be offloaded quickly in order to find a better investment to ensure you, you achieve your goals. And I know we all love our employees, and it's very painful to do that, but if you can't draw that connection between them, then um, you really need to maybe change that. So function and system, okay, behavior. I guess I should have clicked that a little bit ahead. Okay, anyway, I hope I made the case clear about the relationship between human resources and your firm's vision. And now I need to discuss a bit more about how you can make it happen. And that means your firm needs to get on board the concept of what is referred to as systems thinking. Now, I kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, but every employee and every small function of your firm is just another piece of a very complex puzzle, and that all has to fit together. You need to study each piece of the puzzle and how it fits with every other piece. And if it doesn't fit, you clearly have a puzzle that can never be realized. And just like a jigsaw puzzle, the finished product is so much more than merely a sum of its parts. So systems thinking is the synergy that happens within every well-designed firm. And I'm constantly disappointed in so many firms which are clearly comprised of talented people, 
and hardly have any of these firms apply their those same skills that they do for you know for their projects to building a brilliant system to run their own business you're going to spend endless hours making your your let's say if you're a structural engineer you know making a building you know sustainable or whatever but you hardly put any energy into making your firm likewise sustainable okay systems thinking it's kind of a difficult topic if you're not familiar with it but it's um it's a huge topic and there are what are commonly known as 11 laws. I'm not going to go through 11 laws. I kind of have three of them I just want to share with you today. Number one is that today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. So, for example, let's say three months ago you went through some downsizing, like I said earlier, that you just didn't have enough work to keep all your staff busy and you couldn't rationalize payroll for unutilized employees. This really solved that hardship of you know meeting payroll and maintaining a healthy cash flow however suddenly you find yourself unable to deliver on a schedule for a new project that you just won so now you're scrambling to build out the team or your existing staff is burning the midnight oil so your clients don't notice that you have staffing problems and you want to be able to keep your commitments so the law suggests that rather than rush to solve an individual problem like meeting your payroll you need to recognize that there will be repercussions. Instead of rushing into the obvious solutions, engage all of your staff to help identify, to frame, and solve a problem. So a large, diverse group of people will solve a problem from many more angles, and it's more likely to anticipate those unintended consequences. And I could literally take up hours where firms have solved one problem that addresses that short-term need only to deal with unforeseen problems months or even years later. Okay, poll number three. Do you believe your firm can do a better job aligning your human resources with your firm's overall business strategy? So let's go ahead and launch poll three. Please let me know that yes, you think you can do a better job to align your HR with your business strategy or no, you're already doing a perfectly great job. Your staff really is perfectly suited to your firm's business strategy or you don't have any idea why I'm asking you this question. What do employees have to do at all with a business strategy? So that will also tell you what a bad job I've been doing trying to explain this, this theory. Okay, I'll give you um, 10 seconds. Please let me know. And we'll just close it down now. So I say close the poll, let's share those results. And so the answer is most of you say absolutely yes. You believe you've got, uh, you can do a better job. Okay, so that's probably why you're here. So let's move on. Let's close that poll down and let's get into some fun stuff here. Okay. By the way, I went through the one law of systems thinking. So here's the second law I want to share with you. It's cause and effect are not closely related in time and space. And it's a bit more complex, but if you recognize that systems thinking is about looking at the individual and the organization as participating in a larger system, as opposed to simply being an individual entity reacting to external forces, then you can be able to visualize this. And to visualize this, you need to see the interrelationships rather than just things. You need to see patterns or change rather than a mere event. And you need to see structures that underlie complex situations. So when you talk about cause and effect linearly, you focus on immediate events. It's assumed that the cause and the effect are going to occur together. However, in systems thinking, you focus on that interrelationship and the dynamics amongst the various system components. So cause and effect are separated. Actually, they're separated in time and in space. And if you are still confused, let me try this. How many times have you pushed an elevator button? Come on, I, I know you're, you've all done this. You're standing in an elevator lobby and the button is already lit up and still you push it. And then if an, an elevator door doesn't come within five or 10 seconds, you're going to push it again. We're kind of wired to see a linear cause and effect. And that's also why elevator companies often put the closed door button in the elevator, while nearly none of them are actually connected to a controller that will instantly close the door. The manufacturer understands the human psyche and kind of appeases it with this placebo button. 
if things we expect to happen don't occur within a set amount of time, we kind of get frustrated. And yes, while sometimes there is a clear and present relationship between cause and effect, it is not always the case. So once again, the law of systems thinking suggests that you inform and engage your employees and provide them with an opportunity to see the real space between cause and effect. And I'm gonna try one more time to sum up this difficult law. Most firms think if they improve the quality of their product, it's a straight line to profitability. Or if they improve their leadership, it will result in profitability. Or if they improve marketing to differentiate themselves from their competition, it will improve their profitability. But in fact, the connection between all of these things and how they interrelate is far more complex and the path to profitability is not a direct line from any one improvement. So for example, if you fire an employee, you're gonna cut your costs, but that doesn't inherently make you more profitable. Perhaps it will change the chemistry on the team for the better or the worse, and the output could be improved or worsened. There are a thousand invisible connectors between everything in your firm. Okay, I guess I uh, should have clicked those little, little things there. Okay, and the last law I wanted to share, again, I'm not gonna share all 11. The last one is this concept that is, it's. The easy way out usually leads you right back in. And the real message here is don't confuse simplicity with being simplistic. Simplicity typically leads to success, whereas being simplistic eventually will lead you to failure. And in most firms, this law is observed when we try to apply best practices to complex problems. And typically, we have a comfort zone for ideas that were successful in the past. Our instinct is to simply reuse it for the next problem. That's the easy way. Admittedly, many engineering firms do just the opposite as a matter of pride. They will quite often work harder against using best practices in order to satisfy their desire for maybe creativity and uniqueness. But clearly, within every project, there are times where we prioritize and simply apply our best practices. And what this law is suggesting is that when we we see this instinct, you know, we should once again engage our employees and seek the much needed insight and a diverse set of tools to apply the problem. In summary, this is actually hard work. As much effort and ingenuity is required in the management of your firm and your resources as that which you regularly give to your clients without a second thought. And I, I think I would just one more time sum that up that it's almost like, um, the masses is working with your employees to solve everything is far better than some in one individual making a single decision on their own. Um, earlier, I talked about how human resources should be treated as a numerator, and I don't want you thinking about it as a cost control issue. Instead, you are creating value for your firm through your human resources. And whenever we think about creating value, we naturally have to think about measuring it so we clearly understand our performance. We should all recognize that unless you measure something, you really have no way of managing it. And this holds true of your weight, you know, your cholesterol, and your employees. And if you only measure your human resource costs, you know, your employees will be treated as a commodity without any strategic value. Firm principals might be looking at the profit and loss statement and looking at the payroll line item, and they might groan. They're only seeing the cost side of this equation and not the value each individual employee contributes to the income side of that statement. So does your firm have a way to capture, to measure that metric? And my guess is for at least 90% of you, I'm not even gonna bother surveying it because I actually know it. No, you have no way of individually measuring the value for each individual employee in your firm. Now, if I can, if I have time, I hope to have the time to show you what I mean by measuring your employees. I'm going to take you into uh, our core cloud solution. But before I do that, I really want to talk to you about six different ways firms look at their human resources competency. And as I take you through this list, see where you think your firm is aligned. The first type of firm is what's called a cost-driven organization. These are firms where there's vigorous pursuit of production and delivery efficiencies. 
thinking, for example, how quickly and efficiently can we produce that set of construction drawings? These firms have tight control over the cost of the materials and the resources and the overhead. And they also tend to make minimal, minimal expenditures in research and development and marketing. So they are really not progressive firms. Very often, cost-driven firms seek out larger projects which have an economy of scale. And I can't tell you the number of times we have seen firms that treat their largest clients, the ones that pay the most fees, with absolute kid gloves. They'll do anything to maintain that client. However, very often when we look deeper into the actual financial performance of those large projects from those you know, favored clients, we see how truly terrible they are. Your firm should regularly ask the question, which client should I fire? And then look at the analytics to see if that seeming cash cow is truly as it appears. Of course, does your firm have a system in place which provides real-time analytics of client and project and as earlier employee performance and for most of you the answer is going to be no and someone has to do a laborious exercise using microsoft excel it's fraught with countless opportunities for error to figure out how a project performed or a client or an employee and i can almost guarantee that any analysis performed this way is absolutely incorrect. You have bad data, unreliable data, and the moment you include humans into that calculus, you're gonna end up making bad business decisions. The second type of organization is a value-driven organization. It's a firm that focuses on developing sort of a best-in-class you know, capabilities in certain activities, for example, Perhaps your firm is particularly skilled in you know, adaptive reuse of a particular building type. And if I were to fast forward maybe 10 years and I could foresee autonomous driving vehicles and car sharing to become ubiquitous, firms might be sought after to transform all those urban parking garages into something of value. Those firms that have developed a best-in-class approach to working in this building type are going to be very valuable. So value-driven firms promote their reputation for technological leadership, and they work really hard to develop their brand. Those firms also tend to maintain an active research component, and they'll often create partnerships with industries or universities or research organizations for a mutual benefit. So are you a value-driven organization? The third type is a quality-driven organization. These firms seek out information on their clients and they regularly monitor their satisfaction of the, the services that they're providing them and how they feel about their team. So a quality-driven firm, they all have a system in place that will instill a culture of continuous improvement. They're also rigorous about monitoring and screening their consultants you know or subcontractors and product manufacturers and they will not rely on marketing materials because they understand the importance that each member of the extended team has in that overall quality of the project again these are all part of like systems thinking and lastly by the way a quality driven team will invest in research and development they'll re invest in their marketing and improvements to their own services, and they will work hard on employee training. That's how they get to be quality. The fourth type is a service-driven. I'll suspect most of you feel this way. These, uh, at least most of the architectural firms I speak to, are consider themselves service-driven. They clearly recognize the value of the investment they put in their people, and they closely monitor the metrics that determine the service responsiveness from their clients. So a service-driven firm cultivates a good working relationship amongst their associates and their subcontractors and their suppliers since they recognize that service is a human value. By the way, if you're familiar with an NPS, a net promoter score, it's one of their most touted metrics if you're a service-driven firm. And if you're unfamiliar with the term, it kind of measures your client's experience and predicts your business growth. So clients are asked simply one question. How likely are you to recommend the firm to a friend or a colleague? And you measure that on a scale of one to 10, and that's your net promoter score. So service-driven firms are curious about that score, and uh, they'll rate, you know, they'll look at how their employees are rated on like Glassdoor or comparably, 
And you know, that's a rating that you're going to get similar to your NPS, but you're going to get it from your employees as well. So uh, a real service-driven firm is not just looking at how clients rate them, but how their own employees think of the firm. Fifth one up is a speed-driven firm. Maybe uh, some of you here today are that. They're willing to accept some risks associated with delivering a project ahead of its competitors. You know, you'll promise to get the schedule done fast, even though you, in the back of your mind, know that's going to be nearly impossible. And in order to achieve that, you will analyze market trends. You're going to invest in your technology. You know, you're going to stay informed of the latest constructions, means, and methods. And typically, managers are going to be incentivized to be really aggressive about creating new project development processes, things that can actually make this happen on a high-speed, you know, system. So uh, then they're going to invest in those those kinds of technologies. The last one I would just want to share with you is a focus-driven firm. These are firms that put an emphasis on market research and micro-market proclivities. They are very risk-averse and they deeply understand the client's needs and their desires. So management in a firm like this is constantly making little micro adjustments in their own processes to match their client profiles. They're almost tailoring teams that are like bespoke teams just for a particular client group. Uh, okay, so now here's a really simple slide that's probably the most important takeaway from today's webinar. And here are the 10 basics that every firm should practice when it comes to developing your human resources strategy. So if your firm is looking to achieve your annual goals, your strategic goals, please do not ignore these 10 things. One, a safe, healthy, and happy workplace. Clearly doing this ensures that your employees are gonna feel at home, they'll wanna stay for a long time, you should conduct frequent surveys to see where improvements can be made. We can always improve ourselves and sur simply surveying your employees for that um, will make you better at being an employer. This is somewhat controversial for some firms, but an open book management style. I have literally spoken with over 2,000 AE firms. I know this is a tall order for many of you, but this is proven time after time, sharing information about your contracts, your clients, as well as your management object objectives makes people interested in your strategic decisions. It helps align them to your business, your own business objectives. So be as open as possible so that your staff really understands where this firm is going and how they fit into that puzzle. Don't make everything mysterious to them. They don't, you don't let them see it. They think there's a reason going on why they're not seeing it. Um, performance linked bonuses. This is sometimes difficult for firms that really have no way to quantify performance. It tends to be very subjective and your staff is going to be confused as to what criteria is being used when you give them a bonus. So if you have a bonus plan, design it in such a way that your employees understand that there is no payout unless the company hits a certain level of profitability. And furthermore, additional criteria could be the team's success and the individual's performance. And this is why solutions like our BQE core solution, which tracks performance at every level of the business, from the individual employee, to the project, to a phase of a project, to the principal in charge or the manager in charge, and of course, to the client. Knowing how the firm you know, uh, is tracking all of this and, and has an actual system in place really gives confidence that the bonuses are being fair and there's no sort of favoritism going on here. 360 degree performance management feedback systems. I have personally been involved with this at my own architectural firm and I can vouch for the importance of having all of the staff evaluate the performance of the principals and the managers, frankly, evaluate the performance of everyone they have contact with. So when you're a principal, you really hardly ever get to hear the unvarnished truth. But if you use an anonymous 360 degree performance review method, um, your staff can really tell you how they see you. I personally have gotten so much better at my own job knowing what the people who work for me feel about me and, and uh, I made my own corrections. Uh, next up is having a fair evaluation system. So not only should managers evaluate their subordinates, but every employee 
should do a self rating as well. They, you should have a system that uh, maybe it's broader um, and more objective by having the evaluation performed not only by their boss, but maybe by the next higher level employee. So the more people involved that have direct contact with an employee, the fairer the system. Next one is knowledge sharing. Engineering firms are generally better at this than most other professionals. You know, lunch and learns, they don't need to be conducted by vendors, product reps, or consultants. You can encourage your own staff to prepare a presentation. Maybe they just returned from a conference or a seminar. And doing that, by the way, has two positive effects. It makes the presenter become an expert in the topic, and it spreads the wealth of information to the staff who otherwise wouldn't have, any access, have had any access to that. Okay, number seven of 10. Highlight your performers. Encouraging staff at all levels to excel is easily achieved through recognition of high performers. And it shouldn't be focused on leadership as much as on those who have less power, but for whom we all know things would never be possible. So there is no employee within an organization that should be exempt from these celebrations. And as a team, everyone's a critical piece of the puzzle. So do this at staff meetings. If you have a company blog or an internet, profile your employees. They will feel great pride. And uh, we do it here at PQE Software. Um, and it's, it's really very great success here. Number eight, open house discussions and a feedback mechanism. And, uh, kind of we talked a little bit about this with systems thinking earlier uh, great organizations don't only nurture and recognize great ideas but they execute them your employees are the biggest source of ideas nothing stops great ideas other than your firm's inability to solicit and capture them so open house discussions employee and management meetings together, you know, design crits, which we do in architecture a lot. These are all super beneficial um, in part of that feedback mechanism. Number nine, well, you know, number seven is great for giving recognition to exemplary employees. If you couple it with public appreciation, that's gonna be very significant. And a cash bonus is probably going to be appreciated as well, but receiving, you know, thunderous applause by colleagues is also very powerful. So make it public, uh, reward people. And lastly, delight employees with the unexpected. And this can take many forms, but you don't want to have employees playing, you know, whack-a-mole with your HR system. Think about this. We're always seeking to delight our clients when they finally get to experience a completed project. We want to be there with them to see their eyes, you know, marvel at what we've created. And the same holds true for the most important people in your firm, your employees. They will be with you long after your project and have been with you long before it as well. They are your family, and you should really put thought into the things your firm can do that will surprise and delight them, things that will make it impossible for them to imagine working anywhere else. And you can gauge that if you go to Glassdoor for your company, um, you know, see what employees are saying about you, and also when you do an exit interview, by the way, learn by finding out what your employees think you could have done better, because when you do an exit interview, they um, they uh, will often tell you things that they would not have told you otherwise while, while they were still working for you. I did mention if I had a few minutes to just talk, uh, get a little bit about um, BQE Core and human resources. I'm not going to be able to take you through everything. I just want to show you a couple of areas that will help support some of the things I talked about earlier. And by the way, in case you're not familiar, Core is a system built specifically for the AE industry, architecture and engineering. It gives you that structure that we all need. It provides us with confidence that the data we run our business on is accurate and real time. And you heard me talk about people manually working with Excel and how it's unreliable and it's also outdated. So it, Core is really a system with 
real business intelligence. It, it obviates the need for that repetitive and manual labor and all those errors that we were talking about. So in order for me to do this, I'm gonna just really quickly uh, pull a screen over here. Uh, ooh, how do we do this? Okay, so I just logged into Core over here. We'll just share that screen with you. Maybe I'll zoom in a little bit here. There's a lot of metrics here, which I'm not gonna bother you with, but we often will do this when we talk about Core and, and demos for firms. But I just want you to see, if I go to an employee record, so we're going to go take a look at a group of employees. And I'm going to run, because uh, as an architect, I have a project architect here called Sally Ryan. And I'm going to look at her performance. Right? Now, I could look at her performance for her entire history of working at my company or her performance for just last year alone. Okay? And instantly, everything recalculates. And I know what her effective bill rate was last year. For all of her utilized time last year, Ultimately, it brought us revenue that ended up being at only $91 an hour, whereas the system was telling me I should never bill a route for any less than 105, and it's even telling me that the ideal pay rate for this employee should be $28 an hour. So Core knows the salary, the direct multiple of you know, the multiple of direct salary expense that gets me to my break-even point. It knows an employee's utilization and realization rates, but it also knows my profit expectations. As a firm owner, I want a 20% profit. Otherwise, I'll put my money in some investment and go sit on a beach. So it's telling me, according to what Sally did for me last year, if I was to get a 20% profit from hiring her and taking on her as a burden, I should have paid her $28 an hour. And if I were to say, hey, how is she doing maybe this year? So I'll go to, uh, where's this year? Right there, this year, everything recalculates and I see, wow, I can afford to pay her $36 an hour. Paying her $36 an hour will give me a 20% profit margin. And she's had an effective bill rate at $126 an hour, much better than that 91. The only reason I'm bringing this up is if you're going to talk to your employees about performance and expectations and utilization and realization, we have all of these metrics for you built in within our system in real time. And of course, you can go to their HR and you can take a look at you know, how much, and they can actually see this themselves as well, by the way, they can see how much more, you know, vacation or, you know, pay time off I have. Look at their own salary history and see, you know, what's what's the progress I've been making and what kind of grazes I've been given. And, and you can even go in and just take a peek at what their bonuses have been and all these other things. These are all inside of a system that helps us um, uh, keep track of our salary history. Also, employee reviews, very important. I will tell you, please do your performance reviews separate from your salary reviews. If you put them together, you're going to ruin the conversation. Instead, tell your staff when you give them a review what your expectations are of them, what hopefully you know they should achieve, and you know I want you to be really increased. I want your you know realization rate or your um, your uh, ideal um, bill rate to be at a certain dollar per hour. And if they don't meet that, then you will have uh, a reason to talk about that six months later when you're talking about their salary review. These systems are also great, by the way, for tracking any incidents that your employee might have. This is great for, let's say, uh, insurance purposes if something goes wrong with your with your employment with your employees that you'll have a database filled with all of that good stuff and also journaling about your employees maybe there's some achievement that they have that you want to recognize later keeping records of these things inside of a system is just terrifically important i want to leave enough time for q a and i know kari at our company is here as well to help me with that uh read off any questions she has um so uh let me before i do that let me see where am i I, uh, oh, I have a whole bunch of slides here. Boy, I didn't realize that I missed a whole bunch of other stuff. So let me stop uh, that and go back here. And Kari, so be, whoops, be uh, on board for, where's my, there we go. Uh, be ready to ask me some questions. I do want to ask you a quick poll question for, uh, and I'm not going to share these results, but please, if any of you want to hear more about Core, I just gave you a quick little teaser about it. Uh, let us know if you want to try have a free trial or get a live demonstration with one of our sales engineers or speak with one of our specialists. Please let me know now. Let me just launch this real poll question real quickly before we get to Q&A. Launch the poll. We won't share the results, uh, but please at least answer it so we all know you're in attendance. Uh, give you like 10 seconds. Uh, if you want to know more about it, we're happy to tell you more. If not, no hard feelings. So 
Okay. And by the way, if you're not interested, I no no offense, but if you really want to put systems in your office, this would be a good good time to you know look into doing that. And we'll give you three, two, one. Let's close down the poll. And let me um, just see what else I have here. Kari, are you there, by the way? Uh, we're at the Q&A stage I'm right here. Now. I'm here. Okay. Do we have, did I confuse everybody terribly or do we have some questions? Um, yeah, we have some questions. Um, of course, in addition to people wanting a um, slides, wanting the slides PDF of this presentation, which I'm sure we can arrange, um, one person actually commented, um, you know, this presentation is an excellent um, presentation and he really would like to convince his colleagues about the strategic role of HR. So that was a comment. Oh, um, okay. yeah. Um, and also, one person. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So also another person says, but another person says, um, I'm still not convinced as to the point of having 360 reviews. Why should we give our employees a chance to criticize the management? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, here's here's just I'm just going to give you an example because I had a firsthand experience. It's always great to have firsthand experiences. I really thought when I had a team in my studio that I was doing just a brilliant job managing everybody and. You know, people would nod and smile at you, and then you turn your back. And God knows what's happening. But the the 360 review is anonymous, and people talk frankly about it. I was apparently, you know, uh, saying I wanted things, you know, one way, but then demanding it another way, and they felt everything that like my directions were all conflicting, uh, or I was condescending, or there's a whole variety of things that people you will learn about yourself if you don't want your, to learn the truth about yourself or how people perceive you. I would encourage you to to at least then get a business coach uh, or a management coach or somebody who will help you reflect on really how you are as an employer or a manager because we always think we, th we, think we know who we are but we truly don't know who we are. So uh, I know people are afraid to do that because they're afraid to hear the truth. And uh, that's, that's, I can't plead enough for 360 re re reviews. Okay, um, I have a question that says, this core um, HR, um, is this a standalone product? Um, it could be. You can you can get just our BQE core HR solution that will just help you with managing that. Uh, a lot of our customers use core for many other things from time tracking and billing and project management and uh, accounting, you know, all those normal functions in your firm. But if you are interested in just core for HR purposes, you can actually uh, do that as well. Okay, um, and someone asked, so we are a very small company and we outsource all of our HR. Um, is there, does core HR do the same thing, for example, ADP would do? No, this is one of the points I tried to get to earlier in the presentation, which is, yeah, a lot of small firms clearly will outsource them to a professional employment organization or an ADP or something like that, and they don't understand firm culture. Okay, they don't conduct employee reviews for you. Uh, they don't have the intimate relationship you have with your employees, nor do they understand your strategic business um, uh, direction. Well, where are you going with your company? This is something between you, the individual employee and their personal goals in life and, in, and work and your firm's goals and what roadmap you have for your firm. Those PEO firms are just really good for doing compliance things for you, handling your payroll and your benefits, your PTO, filing taxes, all those kinds of stuff. Please think of HR as that's a dollar in your, your in your hand, and how are you going to spend that dollar uh, when it comes to employee? You, you can't leave that to someone who doesn't know you or your employee or your business. Okay. Well, that's it for questions. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll pass it back to you, Beth. Had a schedule for the first time ever. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to grab the screen real quick. Let's see. I just stopped showing it. You should just make yourself the presenter. All right. Okay.
by the way, we'll make sure you get the slide back. If, if we didn't provide it to you earlier, we'll get that to you and you can distribute that to everybody. That's right. Okay, okay thanks, Stephen. Um, as we finish up, please make sure and download your certificate of completion now from the handout section. On the next slide, I did a screenshot of how you can find and access the handout. I've, um, I've had a lot of people have trouble finding the handouts in the handout section. So on the next slide, you can see that I have shown you where you're able to find that. That's going to be in the handout dropdown. Um, if you will click on the PDF file, download that, and it is modifiable. If you missed our note at the beginning and you were watching the live webcast with a group on one person's computer, please go ahead and download the multiple viewer registration form, which is also under the handouts. We need this information in case you're audited and we are contacted to verify this continuing education activity. Additionally, this webcast has been recorded and will be archived on csengineermag.com forward slash continuing dash education. A PDF will be available with the written answers to all of the questions submitted during today's webcast. Again, if you visit csengineermag.com forward slash continuing education in two to three business days to view or download the complete Q&A for this webcast. And that wraps it up. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you to everyone who joined us. And this ends today's webcast. Thanks all. Take care, everybody. Bye, Beth.